doesn't meat cause cardiovascular disease, gout, and cancer? No, it doesn't. In my book, The Carnivore Code, I wrote some great chapters about this. That is an older book. And what's interesting about writing books is that when you freeze your ideas in kryptonite, they often grow and evolve because we are humans. But my views on those things have not changed at all. I continue to believe there is no good evidence that meat causes cardiovascular disease. The only thing that a vegan or a plant-based advocate or someone who is trying to vilify meat with regard to cardiovascular disease could point to are observational epidemiology studies. Studies where there's no experiment done, it's just a survey. And what happens is that sometimes in some Western populations, people who eat more meat do tend to have more cardiovascular disease. Well, in Asia, the men that eat the most red meat have the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease, and the women who eat the most red meat had the lowest rates of breast cancer specifically, I believe. And that's a very big study. In fact, that's a conglomerate of multiple studies with over 200,000 participants, if I recall properly. So what's happening in the US? Well. The high level is that we've been told meat is bad for us for so long that the only people that eat red meat these days, other than the listeners of this podcast, of course, are people who are doing other unhealthy behaviors. <laughs> people who are riding motorcycles, smoking cigarettes, going out at night, partying. You can take those for what you want in terms of your value system, but who eats vegetables? Who eats less red meat? Who eats chicken and fish? Well, people that are higher socioeconomic status, people that get mammograms and colonoscopies and don't smoke and play tennis on Sundays. So you can see what's happening here. This is unhealthy user bias and healthy user bias, um, respectively, or what I'm describing in an observational study from which you cannot draw causative inference. So meat doesn't cause cardiovascular disease. Why do we even think that in the first place? Well, because of these observational studies, ignoring the ones in Asia, and probably because the saturated fat in red meat raises LDL. Well, what else do we know about more saturated fat and less polyunsaturated fat in the human diet? Well, that type of a change, while it raises LDL, lowers oxidized LDL and LP little a. The latter two markers are much better indicators of cardiovascular health and cardiovascular outcomes than LDL itself. What we know in Western medicine is that LDL, low density lipoprotein, is a really crappy metric for cardiovascular disease risk. Some may say, what about ApoB? ApoB is essentially the same thing as LDL. There are a few other particles that carry ApoB other than LDL, VLDL, and LP little a included in that. But ApoB will track with LDL the majority of the time. And guess what? If you eat saturated fat and you limit seed oils, your ApoB is going to go up a little bit. But if your thyroid works well and you are getting enough carbohydrates, your LDL and your ApoB won't go up that much, but any rise in ApoB would trigger the alarm bells of most physicians today. And I think there's not much good evidence at all to say that an isolated rise of ApoB or LDL in someone that is insulin sensitive carries any increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, I've done many podcasts on deep dives on this. I'm giving you guys high level here. You can go back and listen to those if you want. But there are multiple studies that show that in individuals with high HDL, quote unquote, low triglycerides and elevated, quote, LDL, there is very little to any increased risk of cardiovascular disease. That is a healthy triad. Most recently, my LDL was 130 milligrams per deciliter. That's the lowest it's been in a while. And I attribute that to probably improved thyroid function as I've increased carbohydrates, perhaps related to um, getting my iron stores down a little bit. You can listen to previous podcasts if you're curious about what's going on with that and why I'm doing phlebotomy right now. But what is consistent on my blood work is that I am insulin sensitive, a fasting insulin of less than three. Any doctor nurse practitioner, PA, clinician that looks at your lipids but doesn't get a fasting insulin is missing the context, is missing the context. And I will say that strongly over and over. If any physician looks at your LDL and tells you it's too high without looking at your insulin sensitivity, they are missing the boat. So you must interpret lipids in the context of insulin sensitivity. And that is why a little bit of saturated fat, a moderate amount of saturated fat, a lot of saturated fat in meat doesn't raise cardiovascular risk because if you're doing that, if you're eating meat, and organs to get the nutrients, and you're not eating seed oils, and you're not eating grains, your inflammation should be low, endotoxin should be low, your cortisol should be low, hopefully you're sleeping well and getting morning sunlight, maybe getting some real vitamin D from sun exposure on your skin or supplementing with vitamin D, and you're eating a nutrient-rich, high-quality diet, you are going to become insulin sensitive, and that alone will be the single greatest prognosticator, that will be the single greatest mover in lowering your cardiovascular disease risk. I think of an example here 
which is a little bit close to my heart. And it's that it has been really freaking hard to get my dad to stop drinking Glucerna. Glucerna is a weight loss drink that he's drinking that includes soybean oil. He's had improvements with weight loss when he's drunk that in the past, probably due to increased satiety, but he's never measured a fasting insulin, nor have his doctors. And my dad is an internist. He's a retired internist. He's a doctor. His cardiologist, his endocrinologist, his internist, the doctor he sees, none of these people have ever checked his insulin sensitivity. And I fear that as he has lost weight, he has become more and more insulin resistant, more and more metabolically unwell, more and more visceral fat, which nobody's checking. He's just looking at subcutaneous fat. And I think as he's losing weight, he's actually becoming less healthy. And when I see him, it kind of breaks my heart because he's sarcopenic. He doesn't have a lot of muscle and he doesn't look that well. So I don't think my dad listens to this, but uh, maybe somebody can forward it to my dad <laughs> and we'll change his mind. Uh, good luck with that one. So anyway, just because you're losing weight doesn't mean that you're getting healthier. You must understand the root cause of these illnesses and have meaningful metrics in your evaluations. Just because you feel good on keto doesn't mean that all that cortisol and catecholamines are doing good things for you either. So what about meat and gout? I have a whole podcast on this as well. No, meat doesn't cause gout. Here's the rub. Eating meat, eating organs, eating fruit will not raise your uric acid if you are insulin sensitive. I've checked my uric acid countless times and it's always been below four. And I don't think there are many people who can claim to eat as much meat, organs, and fruit as I do right now. If we believe the canonical view that the fructose and fruit, fruit juice, honey, or maple syrup and the purines in the meat and organs I eat will automatically raise your uric acid in geometric proportion to the amount that you eat them, my uric acid to be sure should be through the roof, but it's not. And I've never had gout. So granted my genetics might be favorable, but I've seen this countless times and there's good evidence in the medical literature that this is not the complete story. Surprise, surprise. We've seen that so many times that we are constantly presented with just part of the equation when it comes to these pathologies. Eating meat, eating organs, either fresh or desiccated, eating fruit will not raise your uric acid if you are insulin sensitive. So what is the question that follows? Well, somebody will say, I'm obese and I'm diabetic and I'm insulin resistant. Can I eat those things? Absolutely. Just follow your uric acid. If you have a history of gout, be aware. And maybe you can't eat as much of those things until you get insulin sensitive. But I will tell you this. If you have insulin resistance, changing your diet can improve your insulin sensitivity in a matter of weeks. This was a hotly debated, contested, and I think often overlooked issue during the last viral debacle. Um, people would say to me when I was really passionate about the lack of discussion of metabolic health and dietary quality change in the mainstream narrative that how can you expect someone who's obese to improve their diet and they won't be able to improve their diet or lose enough weight quickly enough to decrease their risk of pathology related to the virus? Um, I said, well, you can improve your insulin sensitivity pretty damn fast if you change the quality of your diet. So regardless of where you are, I think many of the same interventions work. If you have a history of gout, maybe don't eat quite as much meat or have as many organs or as much fructose, but manage those things and quickly you will become insulin sensitive or improve your metabolic dysfunction to a point that you can gradually increase those foods. Those foods didn't cause it. They're not the root cause, and they are the most nutrient-rich sources of nutrition and nourishment for you. Last one is cancer. Doesn't red meat cause cancer? Again, the answer is no. There's no good evidence that red meat causes cancer. This gets into a whole mTOR conversation. Again, there are many podcasts going deeply down this rabbit hole. Look, mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin, is essential for proper human health. You activate it when you work out. You activate it when you lift weights. You activate it when you exercise. You activate it when you fast. You cannot avoid mTOR. And you won't avoid mTOR by avoiding meat because carbohydrates also activate mTOR. Anything that builds your body up and makes it strong activates mTOR. Don't fear mTOR. Don't overemphasize AMP kinase. You don't want to overfast. In fact, I don't think you should fast at all. You will always have periods where mTOR is low because you'll be sleeping. Unless you're sleepwalking and sleep eating Cheetos and polyunsaturated fatty acids and foods that are high in starches that are irritating for your gut, you'll always have periods where your mTOR is off. That's all you need in my opinion. We really don't have good evidence that eating meat triggers excess mTOR and this directly leads to cancers or any of these issues. This is a conflation of the medical data 
And I would recommend that you listen to my deep dive podcast and read the chapter of my book in which I talk about that. Just because there are people known as Laurent dwarves that don't have high rates of cancer and don't have mTOR doesn't mean that turning on mTOR by doing things like eating meat, which creates healthy, strong bones and muscles and ligaments and protects you from age-related muscle loss and sarcopenia and fractures, which are the real killer, doesn't mean that that will lead to cancers. In fact, I think that the main drivers of cancer are excess lipolysis, permeability of fatty acids, permeability of cell membranes related to excess polyunsaturated fatty acids and underlying insulin resistance. Yes, we're back to the same pathologies. Meat doesn't cause cancer. The WHO report on that is incredibly corrupt. You can listen to my breakdowns of that in the past. There's a great article by one of the members of that committee, David Clurfield, who was on the committee in 2015. The reanalysis and the more detailed analysis came out in 2018. The majority of members of that committee were vegans and vegetarians, and so many studies were left out of that consideration. There were only 14 observational studies, I believe, give or take a few studies in that analysis. They left out all of the interventional studies. They did not include any animal studies in the WHO judgment. And eight of those 14 studies, if I remember properly, showed no association between red meat and cancer. Six did, but only one of those six showed that that association was statistically significant. And that one study out of 14 is why the WHO believes that meat causes cancer, that's crazy. And that single one study was done in Loma Linda, California, which is a known Seventh-day Adventist community, a group where healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias are very strong because the mainstream narrative in Loma Linda is that if you are eating meat, you are doing something that is bad for you. And the people that are eating meat in Loma Linda are very rebellious. And in fact, in that study, you can see that the people who ate meat will also very much more likely to be obese and diabetic and unwell. And yet that is where the association between red meat and cancer came from. Well, does diabetes increase your rate of cancer? Yes. Does obesity? Yes. Does red meat? No. Red meat's getting pulled into the fray inappropriately. So don't blame red meat for the things that grains that are ir irritating for your gut, seed oils, high fructose corn syrup. Listen to the last week's podcast about the differences between that and sugar or sucrose. Those are what are causing the problems, not red meat, but often red meat gets pulled in.